welcome to Jurassic Park 3 Minutes, where we'll be discussing the second Jurassic Park sequel for the final time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're concluding 82 minutes of Jurassic Park 3 with a bit of a recap. But uh, before we get to that, David, we got something to talk about, and we weren't going to wait until the Jurassic Minutes episode for uh, November. Um, a few episodes ago, I'd mentioned about uh, the, the uh, legacy dr- Brachiosaur being spotted at some Kmart's near me. I was lucky enough to go out two days later and pick one up. David, you uh, you hadn't found one at any of your Walmarts. You had to go online to find one. Yeah, I did. Unfortunately, um, they're all sold out by me in store, but they were a couple a couple of the areas kind of like dotting around me. They're kind of like too far for me to really want to bother to go. Um, I had them, got them in stock, and so I ordered them online yesterday, actually around noon on my lunch break at work, and just got it in today, so that was like really fast. Nice. <laughs> well, yeah, I checked the websites, and they'd said low stock, and everywhere was showing low stock, so I got in there, and they only had two on the shelves, so low stock was really low stock. Um, they also had the, uh, the blue, the big blue as well, which I, I put on layaway, so... I'll be getting that for nice. Christmas, but uh, I um, I feel a little guilty because I got both of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've put the other one on layaway too and just brought the one home, which I'm glad I did because this thing's been sitting around because it's so big. <laughs> it's got nowhere to go. It's been sitting mm-hmm. on the coffee table and on my computer desk and wherever I've got space to fit it when I'm not doing something <laughs> in that space. But um, mm-hmm. It's it's a thing of beauty. I, I love this thing. It I'm is. so glad I was able to get it. I was really disappointed not being able to get the Spinosaur or the uh, Indominus Rex, but she's beautiful. She very much is. Yes. Um, I opened the thing and I'm I just pulled it. It's separated into like three pieces. You got the head, the neck. I mean, I'm sorry. You got the neck, the tail, and the body. And I pull out the, I, the first thing I pull out is the body, and I'm looking at this thing. It's like the size of a small dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm putting it together and I, I place it on my dresser because it's like the only place it's ever going to fit mm. and I put I put my Thrasher T-Rex next to it just to give it a like a sense of scale that wouldn't be a and, bad scale I mean, actually what's that? Maybe, that wouldn't be a bad scale you could always say the Rex was a little bit younger to not be as big but no I mean it's I mean that's actually probably about true scale yeah, yeah. It's the fresher T Rex next to, next to this animal. I mean, she's massive. Mm. This is Mattel's masterpiece. I don't think I don't know if they'll be able to top this. I oh, yeah, I don't I don't know what else you could do to even be in the running. Like unless they well they've already done the Tyrannosaurus, so unless they done some sort of sick Triceratops or or something like that maybe. But mm-hmm. I mean, the Brachiosaurus is so iconic to that first film. I do, I do have a couple of uh, nitpicks, and they're only, they're only nitpicks. I, I don't like how low the head goes on its pivot when it comes down. Mm. Well, there's no need for it to rotate down that far, especially when it just sort of slides around the front of the body and mm-hmm. uh, turns turns her into a camel. But <laughs> And I would have really <laughs> loved that the tail could come up as well, just so you could get her in that standing pose. As it is now, you sort of got to have a tail hanging off the table or something so she can stand up. Cause it, uh, yeah, I get it. Doesn't... Yeah, but apart uh, apart from that, like the box, the box art is beautiful. I'm not throwing that box away at all. No, <laughs> it, uh, no, I'm keeping the box too. And or what? How much do you pay for it? Um, I paid about fifty dollar US dollar. How how's that compared to the the big T Rex? They were the same price. I, they were the same price point. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah, we had the, the big Tyrannosaur was 99 over here. That's just how our dollar works. Um, but she was 69 and $69 for this. Yes, it's not as much plastic as the big T-Rex, but it just, that's why I got two. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and, and again, feeling guilty, uh, while I was carrying, after I dropped, um, the other one and the big Raptor off it, a big blue off it, lay away. A little kid walked past and pointed to the box I was carrying, going, Mummy, look. And Mummy's going, Oh, yeah, we'll go have a look at the shelf and, and see. <laughs> and knowing yeah. and I was full, full, full aware that there wasn't going to be another one there. But, damn it, I'm the fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I know. My, my conscience is really a hard, hard choice with that. I mean, one, I've been after this thing since October 6th 
But the other, I mean, I mean, the kids, you know, I mean, it's for the kids. I oh, know, and that's I. I did. I really felt bad. It just when the when the colossal T Rex come over, I went to the stores the week after it came out, and it was gone. I mm. I didn't see it at all. It was just lucky. I went into a, a, a independent toy store which had one on the shelf, um, which is probably why I paid why I paid ninety nine for it, not a cheaper price. But mm-hmm. I I did not even expect the Brachiosaur to get over here, just being a, a Target exclusive over there and everything else. Mm-hmm. Or uh, I didn't want to. I know one bloke, uh, one guy. He he paid for it. He managed to get someone to get it for him from Walmart, and it's going to cost him one hundred and thirty dollars to ship it over here. Like it, I didn't want to have to go anywhere near that, and just yeah, yeah. I mean, there was there was stock at there was stock at another Kmart ten k away, so uh, ten <laughs> ten miles away. So mm-hmm. if the mummy wanted, you should go over there and get it. I I, I had I had I did think oh maybe if i go and get the two from over there as well god no i'm happy i've got two i'll let someone else get them (laughs) yeah i mean honestly i went in that that sunday morning that the morning of the 6th to the target and it was like two hours after the store opened and they were already gone Uh, they said they got like one or two in and it was already gone it was like damn and then i and then it hasn't the store is either both online and in in store have not restocked again until until uh, just this week. Mm. I mean, I was I was so close to just riding Target off. I'm like, God, there's the spinal all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't. Again, here might be different, but um, a lot of people ringing around stores and that trying to find a. A lot of stores are only getting. It seems like they only the most. I think I heard was there's going to be four on shelves. Um, mm-hmm. So it seems we're a real limited limited release, and as soon as uh, a lot of stores went out of stock, there's nothing mm-hmm. there's nothing there to replenish the stock. There's, if you didn't get it, it's gone. Yeah, that's what I was afraid was going to happen. Yeah, I was like, oh man, this thing is going to go out of stock. It's never going to come back into stock. I'm never going to get it. I'm going to have to end up paying. I'm going to have to end up doing like what I did with the Spinosaurus and paying up the out of the wazoo for it. And like, you know. Mm, just no, exactly. already already to start writing corporate an angry letter <laughs> uh, again after the spinosaur <laughs> uh, i do love i do love the articulated jaw on it too i do yeah that's nice mm-hmm. and it's i've i've stood up beside the uh the horizon model that i got from the original jurassic park that it was um it was cast off to stan winston uh um, marquette mm-hmm. And this thing is pretty close to it, and, mm-hmm. and not just yeah. in design, but but height and scale as well. Like, yeah, Mattel have done a fantastic job here <laughs> with uh, with just the sculpt of the Brachiosaur. I brought it my because I I was at work when it arrived today, and I um, my uh, parents brought it in from the U, when the UPS dropped it off, and I got home. I was like, "Did I get a package?" And he said, "Yeah, what is that?" I said, "It's a Brachiosaurus. Where is it?" <laughs> <laughs> and give, so, me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I, I, I was, and so I opened. I uh, ate dinner, went upstairs, uh, put it, uh, opened the box, and put it together. And I, I was just staring at this thing, and I brought it downstairs. I said, "If you were wondering what was in the box, this is what it was." And the thing's like four feet tall. But look at that. My mom looks at me and says, "How old are you?" I said, "Well, technically, <laughs> studio scale." Hmm. So I mean, if you want to think about it, it is technically studio scale to the Stan Winston maquette. Yep. You know? I was I was worried when I seen it on the shelf, especially with the the colossal blue beside it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not as big as I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> and I was until, the same thing. Yeah. And then until I pulled it out, and the worst thing was because my son was helping me. We've put the head on and then gone to look in the box and couldn't find a tail. Mm. And I thought, oh no, don't tell me we've got one without a tail, but no, it's fallen on the ground. <laughs> so I was, I was worried for a minute there, but yeah, I was looking, I was looking at the box. And I'm like, this seems smaller than the colossal T Rex did. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm, and I'm like, no way that they fit that big thing in here. And I opened it, I put it together. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know 
Balls. It's much like the uh, the Mosasaur as well. Um, how you mm-hmm. pretty much just had the head head and body exposed on the front, then all the parts behind that you couldn't see. And yeah, again, once you pulled that torso and body out, you realised just how big it was going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, the torso is quite literally this. I've I've seen dogs smaller. You know? <laughs> My dog's smaller. <laughs> My little Jack Russell is smaller than this. And she's already got a problem when I bring the colossal T-Rex out. She's scared of it. <laughs> I'm glad that one hasn't... I'm like, that thing's, that thing's like a rat compared to this. Mm, yep, yep. Yep. We could, we, could, we could gush about this thing all day long, Dave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Anything else you want to bring up quickly before we get into today's discussion topics? Uh, I have the Brachiosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, out I, there, I, I hope you all, you all find one as well because it's um, it's a fantastic figure. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kirby, tell me, when you climbed K2, did you base camp at 25 or 30,000 feet? 30,000 feet. We're, we're pretty close to the top. You're about a thousand feet above it, actually. No, no, that's a common mistake. All right. Um, we've done this for The Lost World, and now we're going to do it for Jurassic Park 3 as well. Uh, I'm just going to go into some brief discussion topics to uh, round out the film. Starting off, I just wanted to ask, and I asked back then too, um, if you feel it's sort of a bit of a natural progression from The Lost World. And I think The Lost World goes after Jurassic Park a lot better than what Jurassic Park 3 goes over after The Lost World. I think... Mm-hmm. More so, just Lost World was wrapped up pretty nicely, with a nice bow on it. Just the animals are there. We're, Hammond's trying to get the uh, Department of Biological Preserves to uh, make the island um, a sanctuary for the animals. But because because these films continue to be made, the uh, animals can't be left alone by the humans. Yeah. We get that to the extreme by the time we get the Fallen Kingdom. But here, I'm I'm sort of glad that they haven't gone. That escalation hasn't. Uh, kept on going where a lot of films by the third one whether it's uh superhero films or whatever the earth's about to end and <laughs> i don't I, I don't think we're going to get trinosaurs eating at the earth and whatever else or aliens coming in but if you're just going to tell another drastic story i think something something small we don't have a lot of characters <laughs> involved um we get a good a good cast of dinosaur characters both cg and animatronic in the film as well and as much as a little a short B movie feel it's got, I think it's um, I quite enjoyed it, and I think for a third film it sort of does does what it needed to do. Uh, I mean, for me, I like I've spoken, I've spoken about this a couple times, both when we started and a couple times in between through episodes, how this was kind of the disappointing Jurassic Park movie of my childhood. I grew up with the first two, and then. This was the first one I saw in theaters, and how like I was mad at the Spinosaurus as a kid. <laughs> but looking back at it, I mean, it does and it doesn't. I mean, it screws with the um, whole Isla Sorna uh, flora. It does the. It just feels like tonally different from the Lost World. But at the same time, I mean. So it does kind of touch upon ideas that the Lost World ended on, and it does kind of pick up some of those strings, but then it never goes anywhere with them, and that was always a problem about how mm. how do we now react? How does the paleontological community react now that now that dinosaurs are known to exist? I mean, how does it evolve? How does it? I mean, we know that it had quite a dip there. That yeah. Grant was really hurting for money, but that's only like really one side of the story. We don't know how the paleontologists viewed these dinosaurs, knowing that they had, were bred with uh, frog DNA filling in sequence gaps. We don't know how they felt about how that might affect the authenticity of the dinosaurs' behavioral traits. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that I wish that these movies talked or touched on paleontologically. They just they just don't anymore. You know. Hmm. 
And we could have had some of that at the start of the film when Grant's trying to find his funding. Mm-hmm. We get him come back and um, him saying we've only got four weeks of funding left or whatever else is... Why is that? Is that because people aren't just aren't donating money to um, to dig sites like this or the universities? Is it because well, we have the one lady saying in the uh, conference mm-hmm. once the UN UN discover or work out what they're going to do off the island, people are going to go there. So there there's not as much of a focus on the paleontological record and and doing all that. Are there? Are there sort of uh, famous paleontologists sort of walking mm-hmm. away from the field and, and lining up and trying to um, uh, not promote um, petition to be allowed on the island to look at the animals? Mm-hmm. Well, the idea that these first three movies set up is that these dinosaurs, despite being having sequence gaps filled in by modern day amphib- amphibians, are still to be thought of as dinosaurs as they were, you know? And then Jurassic World comes in and moves like, they're not real dinosaurs, they're never real dinosaurs, I don't, I don't know why you tr- want to treat them like they were, <laughs> you know? Mm. It's just kind of like a slap in the face, like, wait, so we're not going to pretend that the paleontologists from 1993 to 2001 kind of treated these dinosaurs as real dinosaurs? You know, there's there's a lot there's a lot those new films slap us in the face for for uh, <laughs> what come before and and we will get there but um mm, it's yeah it's a shame it's a big shame mm-hmm. even in the new film it's still not addressed in the new films no we don't we don't know what the what the world looks like. Off new, off, off new blur. No, I mean the the thing about these new films is that, that the stories are almost too contained. They don't have any kind of like, I'm not saying like world changing, but at the same time, it was kind of career changing for a lot of for even going back as far as the first movie, the the line that was in there, um, it looks like we're out of a job. Don't you mean extinct? You know, I mean, this changed a lot of things. We saw that in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, Zia was a paleo veterinarian. But what does that entail? You know, we we see her doing a transfusion. But I mean, any EMT off of, off the street can do that. Well, especially when she acknowledges that she's never seen any animals in person. So she's mm-hmm. probably working off of off dummies or some sort of um, computer programs. Mm-hmm. But in saying that too, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's vets that specialise in dogs or or something like that that couldn't go to a zoo and do a transfusion on a lion. Although it's just a big cat, so they probably they probably could. But um, mm. and may, maybe maybe a little bit more time in production before the film started. Um, might have been able to fill some of those issues. We we have the little drops there of not remembering um, the Spinosaur from InGen's list and mm-hmm. all those sort of little drops there that hint at a much bigger story, but it's not going to be this film. Mm. And that's probably one of the more disappointing things about this movie is, like you said, how nicely the Lost World wrapped things up. And then this thing comes in asks a bunch of questions and never answers them. Mm. And even go, even going to now, most of these questions are just never left answered, or just left unanswered. They're never, you know? I mean, even Sorna is, even Isla Sorna as is a, is its very existence is still kind of a ambiguity going as far, I mean, we know that it's, it's purchased by Mizrani with, um, AC around the clock UN and ACU um, uh, vigilance, and it's kind of implied that they took dinosaurs off the island to stock Jurassic World, but it's never said how many dinosaurs they took off. If they, um, if it's completely devoid of dinosaurs, what happened? I mean, they kind of touch upon it in the virals, uh, in the viral campaigns, but even 
Jack Ewens, who wrote the viral campaigns, admits that he purposely left it ambiguous so he doesn't kind of step on toes, you know? Well, and with a third film coming out, you can't say something and have the third film completely contradict something that um, mm-hmm. that is wrote, even though he was under the uh, given the go ahead by Universal, and that's that's even there. Like a lot of that marketing stuff, sort of again, like this film touches on stuff and doesn't answer it at all. Just gives you little nuggets of information to perk your interest, and it's like, well, where's the rest of it? What we we went back to, or even even the stuff surrounding. This film, it, the, we 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 learn that um, the survivors are interviewed and paid off to be quiet. We know the Trinidons get to Canada and Hoskins goes in and and contains them. But apart from that, like as you're saying, end of Lost World, Sauna was getting set up as a preserve. These animals need our absence, not our presence, to survive. Um, he. They get to the on. They're rescued from the on. Surely the navy is saying this is the last straw. We're not. We're going. No, we're not going to keep on doing this. But there's no. There's there's no out, no outcome out of it at all. And sadly, this is the last time we see sauna, which makes it even more frustrating. I have a theory that there are two kinds of boys. There are those that want to be astronomers and those that want to be astronauts. The astronomer. Paleontologist gets to gets to study these amazing things from a place of complete safety. But then you never get to go into space. Exactly. It's the difference between imagining and seeing. Be able to touch them. And that's that's all that Billy wanted. All right, moving on. Favorite characters. We don't have a lot to pick from. Um... I do love seeing Grant back here, and I do... It's sort of seeing more of a... It's not just cranky old Grant, it's... We, we got that PSD. Um, he doesn't want anything to do with the islands, but is... Um, it sort of roped in voluntarily under, under the ruse of being paid money to keep his uh, dig site going, but then uh, gets stranded there and realises he's doing it all for free. I think the one film, one the one good thing in this film is the fact that they got at least one returning character to come back. If mm-hmm. if Grant wasn't here, I think there'd be a different story with uh, the enjoyment of the film. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this this movie would be very. I mean, without Grant, it would be very almost like B movie level. You know, it would just it mm. almost seem fan fiction and by in on on that kind of level. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Your uh, your favorite character doesn't even survive the film. So, who, who do you pick for your favorite character? I I pick Udesky because I mean, of course, Grant is kind of almost the default. You you love Grant, you you like him in this movie, but I've, I've there's not a lot of new characters in this movie that are likable, really. Mm. Cooper's an ass. Amanda's an idiot. Paul's an idiot. <laughs> Eric's the super kid. Cooper's, I don't know, I already mentioned Cooper. Nash is kind of just there. He he's, he's not even in, really in the movie for like five minutes. And Billy's <laughs> an ass. <laughs> Udesky yeah. is kind of the only guy who's, I mean, you you feel for the guy. He was a booking agent. He's not even supposed to be there, and he's stuck in this situation. And he's just like, I mean, let's say I have a really, I have a soft spot for Michael Jeter. I think he's yeah. a fantastic actor. May he rest in peace. And I think that. He did a good job with what he was given, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think that having the uh, the actor behind the character as well, like I'm, <laughs> you said, Paul was useless, but just having uh, William H Macy, some of those moments we picked up on um, during the film where he's trying to get his backpack buckled up and Udesky <laughs> sort of catches him doing, it and he just gives that dull stare, and Udesky helps him out. And some of those moments are moments are great, and. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, even Udesky himself, it's a real shame we didn't get to see him go out and see that cut stuff, um, mm-hmm. him trying to fight off the raptors and not just be dead on the ground. Mm-hmm. Hey, like you said, Paul Kirby, I mean, William H. Mace is a great actor, but and he's clearly doing the best he can with what he's being given. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, the character is written like such a bumbling idiot that, I mean, William Macy can do bumbling, but I mean, there's even a point where it's almost kind of condescending to the to the actors. Yeah. Oh, you know? 
I think they're looking for someone. Next up, we got favorite scene or set piece. Um, I one 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 that I really love is the uh, the plane crash. Just the miniature work there with uh, that crane, the sequence of uh, crane, the plane sequence of it uh, crashing into the foliage after hitting the spinosaur. But also, I really love the lab the lab sequence. Just seeing more of Injun's abandoned buildings and just adding more of those pieces to the uh, to the Injun puzzle. David, you. Uh, you enjoyed the aviary. Oh yeah. Aviary has pretty much always been my favorite set and scene in this movie. I mean, they just, the way they filled that those sets on for the aviary, just cutting it and the editing of the scene, just taking all those different set pieces and editing them together. is fantastic. Mm. Yep. I know if we, I, 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 was, I was thinking about Jay. Uh, and I was, when you, contacted me to do the uh, conclusion episode here and I was thinking we we should get a uh, we should uh, try to contact him but then I remembered it's we were doing this in five hours and he might not even answer back in time you know <laughs> yeah we, and the guy always got a busy schedule but yeah I know he would agree with me with the uh, AV heavy scene saying that's one of the that's one of the great moments in this movie mm. yep and again, all these are our favourite or best <laughs> best things we liked about. We're not we don't want to talk too negative about it, and I'm sure that uh, T Rex versus Spino wouldn't wouldn't appear on anyone's list for the best part. <laughs> One of the most controversial scenes in this in the entire franchise. And now yep. there's some guy going around with a petition trying to get it back into the, get another one in the movies. I'm like, really, uh, dude? Mm, yeah. Yep, um, but again, like the that whole aviary sequence, it's all practical. It's all we know that massive set was built. Um, for the most part, we have some of the uh, the practical trinodons there at parts, the baby trinodons as well. It is it is pretty good, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and it's easily like the most atmospheric scene in the entire movie. I mean, we just saw that fog wafting through the canyons and stuff mm. and, and gi- we're gonna talk massive massive um uh canyon set that they shoved that they got in actually two scenes out of that you discovered mm. yep and we're gonna get to the uh, the score in a minute but it just the music matches the sequence as well so well from uh tiny peckett and turdons to billy oblivion so mm. um but we'll talk about more of the uh, score in a minute. Let's do this one at a time, shall we? Favourite deaths? We didn't get too many. Most of the cast survived. David, you enjoyed uh, Cooper's last stand. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, talking first about yours, Udesky and the Raptors, I absolutely, like you said, or mentioned earlier, it would have been amazing to see the extended... Uh, scene where he fought back against the Raptors with that stick only to unfortunately succumb to their attacks. That was mm. probably one of my favorite deaths, but because he was my favorite character, I didn't want to mention that one. Cooper <laughs> is a really cool death, and not just because it's become a meme on uh, Jurassic Raptor posting. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But um, I remember that one being being as a kid. Me and my dad would try to uh, pause the movie, pause the DVD right in the right moment to see the cl- the jaws just about to clamp down on the on the Cooper there. Mm. I just thought that was well, really cool how they did that. Yeah, and also too, like we'd heard heard the gunshots, heard the animal roar. We know it's not a Tyrannosaur. Grant says it sounds bigger, and it's our real first little introduction to the uh, the Spinosaurus itself. But just He's obviously injured. He's uh runs out on that runway, and his only his only chance of survival is being on that plane. And here it is flying up the uh, runway towards him, and you can just see mm-hmm. the look of defeat in his face. Oh yeah, it, I uh, mean, that is a great moment of acting, and in, uh, in that part of the uh, from that actor in that scene, just that utter look of terror in his eyes. I mean, he really does not want to be left behind on that from that plane. No, <laughs> no. Did you read Malcolm's book? Yeah. 
So. I, I don't know. I mean, it was kind of preachy. And, and too much chaos. Everything's chaos. It seemed like the guy was kind of high on himself. Well, that's two things that we have in common. Uh, next up, is there one thing from the script or novel that uh, you wish made it into the final film? We've been talking about the novel and script comparisons the entire time for the uh, the film, and I would have really loved to uh, to see the overnight stay at the lab, have that water tanker in the uh, equipment yard behind the lab compound, and then, of course, seeing more of the, uh, the harbour or the, the marina, which you agreed with as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just the idea of it sounds really cool, and some of the concept art we have for it is, looks really cool, and I, I just would have liked to have been able to see that on a movie, you know? Mm. Yep. The other one I would have liked to see from the script is just Billy staying dead. I feel like his um, his not being dead at the end of the movie kind of negates, in a way, his sacrifice that he made to save Eric, you know? Mm. Well, not only that, too, it's sort of... It um, it takes away what he did. Um, what he did was uh, was bad, and him surviving it at the end isn't. Uh, I'm not really a fan of. Uh, I, yeah, him staying dead. I, the the film needed that uh, that moment of uh, mm-hmm. he, he, his him being killed or taken away by the Trinidons and and not returning. Yeah. Well, like you said, he almost kind of needs that soul to it, you know. And mm. him returning kind of just like it, it just kind of negates it. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> and then but then for his, his only reason to return is for uh, him to return the hat. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, what I always heard was that the actor Alessandro uh, Nicola, I think his name is, right? Mm. Yeah, and, uh, I think so. <laughs> he he complained to Joe Johnson about his character dying and so they just rewrote the ending for him to be in there in the helicopter when he at the end yeah well as we know from the script he he was written out of it so don't uh don't let your actors dictate how you want to direct your films (laughs) directors And lastly here, we're going to talk about the uh, the soundtrack for the film. 
uh, Don Davis coming on to uh, to do this over uh, John Williams. It's it's like a lot of sequels, whether it's original uh, original composer coming on to do the soundtrack, or if it's someone just taking over. We get a lot of, and I think I mentioned it when we started the film. There's a lot of Jurassic Park theme in here that doesn't need to be here. Yeah. Every time there's some sort of triumphant moment that JP theme plays, <laughs> whether it's whether it's JP related or not, mm-hmm. we get a couple of little homages back to the original original score. Like the uh, I had it open. Sorry, get some titles. Um, the Raptor Room and um, and that with the Raptors in the lab. Like it's it's not the exact to uh, back when we were seeing that first baby Raptor, but it's a little callback to it. The, the intro to Isosauna sailing situation I really love as well. And just the um, more of the score throughout the film, how we have that real slow, ominous droning noise, like at night time when we transition to the uh, ankylosaurs walking through the jungle and, and stuff like that. It just sort of sets up the darkness of the island mm-hmm. that we're seeing in this film, uh, more so than what we see in The Lost World. David, what tracks did you enjoy? Um, I originally put here the dinosaur flyby, but I mean, you are kind of right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually take that back. Um, like you said, it doesn't kind of the problem with the soundtrack here. It doesn't really take its time to be its own. You know, the movie. I mean, The Lost World gave us tons and tons of great original theme, and Jurassic Park Three doesn't do that. It just kind of it adds a little bit, like we get the mercenary theme uh, from Cooper and Nash.
and we get the Kirby's leitmotif, but I still think that some of the better moments of the soundtrack do come from the reissuing of earlier scene of earlier themes. Like for example, the dinosaur flyby. I do like how it go does the triumphant Jurassic Park theme, and then goes into the um, the Jurassic Park theme. I mean, I'm sorry, the um, <laughs> the Cooper Nash theme. Yeah. Yep. And the other one I do like is Don Davis's rendition of that. Um, Welcome to Jurassic Park, the um, one that plays at the end of the first movie and during the Brachiosaurus scene in the first movie. Hmm. Yep. 